everyone. Can you hear me in the back there? How's the sound? Do I need to speak up? Okay. For everyone who was here last week, we had some technical issues. I hope that we figured them out um, today. So if um, the speaker, if um, our wonderful speaker, Professor Gaylord, needs to speak up, can someone in the back please raise their hand so he can um, use his, his, teaching, uh, his teaching voice? That'd be great. So um, it is 7 o'clock, so let's get started. And I want to welcome everyone here tonight to our second installment of our 2024 Spring Lecture Series. It's wonderful to see so many of you here um, again this evening. And without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce Don Gaylord. And he is the research archaeologist and an instructor, instructor of anthropology at Washington Lee University. After six years in the United States Navy as a nuclear reactor operator, there's a story I'd like to know. Don shifted gears to anthropological archaeology and worked in the Williamsburg area for several years. While in graduate school at the University of Virginia, he began work as an archaeologist at Thomas Jefferson's Monticello, where he worked for 13 years. He has been at Washington Lee for 11 years, where he teaches courses in anthropology, archaeology, and history. So please join me in welcoming Don Gaylord. Thank you very much. Um, so I'll just go ahead and get right started. Um, uh, I'd like to at least start out with a, what we commonly call a land acknowledgement to recognize that this land that we're on and that Washington and Lee is on was originally the ancestral homelands of the Monacan Indian Nation, a people who are part of a broader group of Eastern Sioux and speaking peoples, including the Saponi, the Okanichi, the Manahoacs, and others. Um, for at least a thousand years and quite likely a lot longer, these folks lived in, in uh, uh, this area um, and stewarded the land and the resources before Anglo-European people arrived here in the early 18th century. So uh, the site that we're talking about, the broader story we're talking about is in the Great Valley of Virginia in and around Lexington, the county seat of Rockbridge County. Um, in what is known as the Great Valley of Virginia, and notwithstanding our, our uh, I'm from Washington and Lee, our university's hymn is called Shenandoah, and our literary magazine is called Shenandoah, we are not in the Shenandoah Valley in Lexington. We're in the James River Valley. There are important differences between the James River drainage uh, of Rockbridge County, the rough boundary between the James River and the Shenandoah drainages through the Potomac River is between Augusta and Rockbridge County. Um, located just outside of the town of Lexington is what's known as Mulberry Hill, a landform um, uh, upon which um, early Scots-Irish settlers uh, uh, um, first came in the 17, late 1730s and early 1740s. Uh, Mulberry Hill is a landform, but it's now um, uh, lent its name to uh, buildings, in fact. And so, for instance, there's a famous plantation house on the landform Mulberry Hill that is now known as Mulberry Hill. Um, and all of this land is part of a large tract of land often called the Benjamin Borden Tract of 92,100 acres. Um, the Scots-Irish people settled in this area largely um, at the sort of uh, instigation of the um, uh, governor of Virginia. There was, um, uh, of course, long-standing territorial um, differences between the colonial endeavors of the French and the English, and the exact boundary between those two colonies was not exactly clear. So by the 1720s, 30s, 40s, there's this sort of move to sort of start seizing the land that is in a gray area between the two, and in fact really, really starts, it gets a jump start in 1722 with the um, so-called Knights of the Golden Hors Horseshoe Expedition across Swift Run Gap into Rockingham County near present-day Harrisonburg. Um, Lieutenant Governor Spotswood and a group of uh, elite folks traveled into the area to claim the space for England. And that, in fact, also then spurred several treaty negotiations, not least of which was the Treaty of Albany, uh, also 1722, in which they treated with the Iroquois Confederacy to purchase what they thought was the land 
uh, of the current settlement at the time. And we'll find out that there was some disagreements as to what exactly that boundary was that eventually leads to the Treaty of Lancaster about 20 odd years later. Um, and how I got drawn into this, I started archeology span uh, at uh, um, Washington and Lee in 2013, had completely other sort of projects on my mind, um, but Washington and Lee University, where I work, um, decided that they were gonna build what they called upper division housing. It was housing for third year students to live on campus. And as it turns out, part of our back campus was also part of a 1782 predecessor institution's campus, and that predecessor was known as Liberty Hall Academy. And so starting in 1782, our predecessor institution existed on uh, Mulberry Hill, and part of this... Um, uh, part of this parking lot was gonna impact that 1782 campus, and so that caused us to then go revisit some archeological work that was done there back in the 1970s, from 1974 to 1979, by Professor William, uh, or Professor William, Professor John McDaniel. Um, uh, he was the first anthropologist and first archeologist at Washington and Lee, and we are in fact now just next month celebrating the 50th anniversary of archeology span at Washington and Lee, um, thanks to Professor McDaniel and generations of students at Washington and Lee who excavated a number of sites and a number of projects, but that first uh, one was the Liberty Hall campus. And so much of the work he did there was groundbreaking for the time. It was at the sort of infancy of historical archeology span when some of the methods and uh, means by which archeologists engaged in historical research were still being figured out. Um, and so in fact, he did some of what is today state-of-the-art archeology, span namely a stratified random sample of the 20-acre campus of the 1782 Liberty Hall Academy at a time, for instance, when Colonia Williamsburg was bulldozing the plow zone on sites, Professor McDaniel was sampling that plow zone, looking for information that was really important to the eventual reassessment of the work that they did back then. Um, at the time he arrived there in 1974 and put the first shovel in the ground on April 23rd, 1974, the only visible buildings on the landscape were the Academy House ruins that you saw on my first slide and a red brick farmhouse known as the Liberty Hall Farmhouse, um, which best current research suggests was erected in the uh, 1890s. Um, but by using this stratified random sample, Professor McDaniel was able to identify a number of in additional buildings through the artifact distributions they identified during excavation and through the direct evidence of stone foundations in a number of places. Um, when we first started looking at this work, we realized that Professor McDaniel's sample while groundbreaking and forward thinking for its time was um, in fact not complete. If you notice on this stratified random sample map here, there are a number of red check marks on the map they made, and those are spots where the sample hadn't yet been completed. And as it turns out, that's in an area where there was really very dense greenbrier and raspberries and Virginia creeper and other shrubberies that made it really, really hard to get through. And so they skipped over some of the sampling spots because of the density of the, the vegetation. So uh, initially, I thought we might have to just basically complete Professor McDaniel's sample, but I also recognized from my research at Monticello where we also, in fact, were doing a stratified random sample 40 odd years later, that it's quite likely that his sample while forward thinking was just a little too small to capture the kind of evidence that we could really interrogate today using modern computer methods that they didn't have in the 1970s. Um, he identified a number of buildings, including this is a, a composite map of what they called Structure One because it was the first structure they identified archeologically um, and identified eventually as the likely location of a stable erected at Liberty Hall Academy in around 1800. Here is the uh, um, Structure One under excavation. You can see the Liberty Hall ruins in the background and its proximity to those uh, ruins. Um, and so identified as a stable, but when we started going back to Professor McDaniel's work, we started to realize that 
you know, for instance, why is there a silver spoon and a bone-handled, probably two-tined fork and refined earthenwares that are things that people typically use to eat or take tea with or coffee, um, there were a lot of sort of interesting questions that weren't quite adding up. Um, and as we dug deeper into both Professor McDaniel's research and his published work, we started to recognize that they realized that they had, you know, something more going on here, but they happened to be, you know, heavily focused on the academy period, which was from 1782 to 1803. Um, it, the academy stood there for about 20 years until the three-story academy house burnt down, at which point the school moved to its present location about a half mile closer to Lexington. Um, but as we continued to do this research um, in our special collections in the county courthouse, um, in the Augusta County uh, Courthouse, which as it turns out Rockbridge used to be part of Augusta County, we found some neat um, historical things like photographs and this is a photograph of, uh, from of roughly 1910 that seems to suggest that um, uh, structure one was still standing into the 20th century. Um, and then uh, an additional building that was identified very late in the game in 1978, 1979, identified at the time as structure nine was uh, uh, eventually identified as a steward's house that was erected shortly after the academy house was erected by the same stonemason in order to be able to um, provide uh, room and board for the students. So it would have had a state-of-the-art kitchen in the basement, a sizable fireplace uh, on one side, and here is the current um, state of things that um, uh, we've been able to, um, through uh, some generous funding by the university vice president and treasurer, to do some restoration work thanks to uh, New Dimensions um, uh, Masonry, uh, John uh, and Jesse Friedrichs, um, uh, uh, co-owners. Um, we've been able to re established these stone walls as they would have stood in 1978-79, but had in the interim um, gotten into pretty bad shape. Um, here is a view in the opposite direction showing the much larger cooking hearth that would have probably been the kind of hearth that had, you know, space to uh, put several different smaller fires and a number of different uh, 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 cooking vessels uh, within, including likely um, rotisseries, etc. And here is, in fact, a, um, uh, a depiction of the steward's house that the university erected immediately after the move into Lexington. This is drawn by David C. Humphreys. He was a trained uh, surveyor and map maker, trained by Je Jedediah Hotchkiss, um, uh, General Robert E. Lee's uh, map maker during the Civil War. Professor Humphreys eventually becomes a, um, uh, an engineering professor at Washington and Lee, and he drew this picture of the front campus steward's house in the new location from memory, but it, it allows us to have at least a sort of an idea of what the trustees of the academy thought a steward's house ought to look like and what it ought to include, not least of which was a large dining room, open area. We know from historical documents it would have included um, uh, benches and uh, large long tables. Um, it, too, of course, also had a number of ceramics and uh, uh, artifacts associated with food production and consumption, not surprisingly, because it was a state-of-the-art kitchen and dining hall, um, but a number of the artifacts unambiguously post-dated 1803. So the Academy House burns down in January of 1803. For some reason, a lot of our artifacts post-date, and if you look at these pale blue transfer print wares, they date from you know, roughly 1820 to 1865. So there's literally no way they could have been produced or consumed at that site during the time that the academy was uh, operating. And so that opened a whole new avenue of evidence. What exactly is going on at Liberty Hall? What is going on on this landscape after 1803? And so there's a, 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 additionally a spring house on the site and it was the, largely the reason why the school was located where it was. There were two very strong, fresh-flowing springs, and they had imagined as many as 50 students living in the academy house, so you needed to have enough 
flowing water to be able to provide both the, the, the water they needed, but also, of course, the water for cooking, uh, et cetera. Um, and as we started analyzing the artifacts from Professor McDaniel's excavations, we realized that a significant portion of those artifacts post-date 1803. And so, for instance, a number of these white wares, as we call them in archaeology, are a type of refined earthenware like the earlier creamware and pearlwares, but again, these all unambiguously post-date 1820, and so again, there's no way they could have been used by the stewards and the students living in and eating in the academy steward's house. So then, once again, what's going on here? And so some of the earliest and easiest things to look at in doing historical research are things like wills and deeds and estate inventories. And if you've done any kind of genealogy work, all you have to do is know the landowner and go to the county courthouse and look in their records in the index of wills or in the index of uh, deeds, and you can find information about them. And we know that the subsequent owner of the, the Mulberry Hill landscape was a man by the name of Andrew Alexander. He was an alumnus of Liberty Hall Academy. His father was one of the inaugural trustees of Liberty Hall Academy. And as it turns out, when his estate inventory is done on 6 February 1844, lo and behold, he is holding 25 African American people in bondage as chattel slaves at the Liberty Hall site. Um, and so then that, you know, sort of brought the question is like, so how can Professor McDaniel using, you know, sort of state-of-the-art methods, you know, he knew that these kinds of things were going on here. And in, in the interim of doing a, a much deeper dive into his paperwork, into his research, um, how is it that, you know, we didn't learn about enslaved people in his 1994 monograph? And it's largely because he was so uh, uh, heavily focused on the academy period because, in fact, historical archaeology at that time had not yet, even as a discipline, had that sort of come-to moment in order to understand how enslavement worked in a lot of places in Virginia. Um, and, in fact, as a person working on an academy site, an, an, uh, an educational institution, he was groundbreaking. Most people were working on the large plantations like Mount Vernon and Monticello and Colonia Williamsburg. He was also focusing extensively on uh, a dissenting religious group who were minority outsiders in the Colonial Virginia um, uh, area um, and so um, was focusing on people who had not yet been looked at in historical archaeology. So he had, you know, really sort of groundbreaking, uh, eye-opening ideas to focus on at the time, but you know, how, how is it that enslavement gets erased from this kind of work uh, at the time? And, you know, there are a number of ways to think about it, but a classic uh, text on historical archaeology is James Dietz's In Small Things Forgotten, and if you look closely at his first edition and his revised edition, it really is a really important and uh, I think very good reflection of the shifts that took place in historical archaeology over that time period focusing to most of an extent on uh, 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 white folks in the historical record, um, though he did have a really important early chapter on a place called Parting Ways in Massachusetts, which was an African-American community. But his second edition, the revised edition, more fluidly incorporates the African-American experience and especially the experience of enslaved people into the story of colonial America. And so here's an uh, um, uh, uh, insurance policy of the Liberty Hall Academy House, again, which burnt down in 1803. We had the, the great good luck as an institution to buy a fire insurance policy about a month before the building burnt down. <laughs> so the Academy was able to use that insurance money to purchase and build new buildings on the front campus location. It stood for 10 years without fire insurance and burnt down a month after it got insurance. Um, and then, you know, as, we, as I continued to delve into the archives, additional uh, um, uh, resources started popping up. And this is, in fact, found by um, Steve Thompson, who used to be with Ravenna Archaeological Services when they were doing a back campus master plan for us. And it, in fact, is a, a 1939 uh, aerial photo of the Liberty Hall uh, landscape. And it includes the ruins here a much, much later, probably 1920s horse barn, uh, 
a horse riding track, and a number of other buildings that were not identified by Professor McDaniel in the 1970s. And that's likely because many of the 19th century buildings that were erected after Liberty Hall Academy were much more ephemeral. They were log cabins, they were often sill-aid structures in which wood was laid directly on the ground rather than having a significant stone foundation or a significant brick foundation. Um, but significant transformations of this landscape after 1803. Um, a close-up of that photo, and then uh, a really tantalizing bit of evidence from uh, Andrew Alexander's will about the enslaved people, and he notes that if my slave shall comply with the conditions of a paper in my large green pocketbook, of course you can read that, um, but the conditions aren't included in the county courthouse record. So we have this very tantalizing evidence about the enslaved population at Liberty Hall, and that's what it was called after Liberty Hall Academy left the site, was Liberty Hall Farm or occasionally Liberty Hall Plantation. Um, potentially very interesting that he, you know, he writes his will uh, about two months before he passes away, but he's still very much interested you know, eight years later that the enslaved people that he made a personal agreement with should have their freedom. Um, I then started expanding my research into the broader sort of um, uh, uh, Rockbridge County, um, looking at the uh, uh, inaugural trustees of Liberty Hall Academy and their first personal property tax records of 1787. We see that Every single one of the trustees from Liberty Hall Academy who live in this tax, tax district are people who hold uh, African Americans enslaved. Um, uh, with, uh, of course, John Boyer at the upper extreme of that with 33 African Americans held in bondage and a man by the name of Andrew Moore with only one. But one of the things that's important to look at here is that these six men own roughly 20% of the enslaved people in all of Rockbridge County. So this isn't a widespread practice, it's a practice by newly burgeoning elites in the area to establish a kind of society in, in this part of Virginia that is beginning to mimic more what we used to know was taking place in Eastern Virginia. People often distinguish the sort of tobacco plantation society of the 17th and 18th century from Rockbridge County, and that is that holds through probably the American Revolution, but is dramatically changing after the American Revolution for a lot of reasons. Um, and here's a graph showing the proportion of chattel slaves being held by people in the Lexington uh, Tax District of Rockbridge County from that first tax uh, assessment until 1820, and the relative proportion of investment in enslavement to the traditional agricultural investments um, triples during that time, and that's just in terms of absolute numbers of enslaved people in relation to other chattels like horses, mares, mules, and uh, et cetera. Um, but if you take that absolute number and look at the actual economic value of enslaved people vis-a-vis -vis those other kinds of chattels, the amount of investment is much more uh, uh, closer to 20 percent or 20 times increase in investment by these folks in this part of Rockbridge County. Um, and so then that brings me to the sort of ancestors of Andrew Alexander and his descendants, and they really are a sort of uh, a real sort of, I think, um, example of this transformation. The, the earliest settler in the area, a man by the name of Archibald Alexander, referred to in his lifetime as Old Erzbal. He was a captain in the, the colonial militia. He was the first sheriff of Rockbridge County. Um, he held almost a thousand acres of land. By the time he was um, about to pass away, he only held one person in bondage, a woman by the name of Phoebe, and if you look at that assessed value, it's really through the roof. And that's as a consequence of the depreciation of the continental currency during the American Revolution. She, was not, she would not have been worth that much uh, 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 at another time. Um, but uh, 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 Old Erzbel, Archibald Alexander, um, he was um, 
uh, a part of a movement in the Presbyterian Church known as the New Lights. There was a great awakening taking place in the 1740s and 50s, and you see a division within the Presbyterian Church between the old lights, so-called, and the new lights, and uh, at least in part, what that division was based on was the sort of uh, notion of enslavement and whether it was a moral um, evil or not. And so, um, in fact, in his grandson, the Reverend Dr. Archibald Alexander's uh, autobiography, he notes that his grandfather actually went to Pennsylvania and uh, experienced preaching by uh, um, uh, Reverend uh, uh, um, uh, Whitestone, um, uh, in that time of the uh, Great Awakening, and he was really affected by the preaching and comes back a, a, a sort of a new man at the time. Uh, Archibald's son, uh, Old Ersbell's son, William, at the time of his appraisal, only holds um, six people in bondage, but he had, in fact, owned uh, uh, 10 or 11 people before that, but prior to his death, he knew he was dying. He actually gifted several of his enslaved people to his children before his death, um, uh, and so um, then we get to um, Andrew Alexander, the grandson of the initial settler, and he holds 25 people in bondage at the time of his death. Um, as I note in my um, abstract for the, the paper, um, his granddaughter, um, in fact, marries into the Bruce family of Berry Hill Plantation in the south side of Virginia, which is one of the largest slaveholding plantations in America, and uh, I think at one point in the late 1850s, the second richest family in America. Um, again, based on uh, the uh, bondage of human beings for the production of value. Um, and so, the, the historical documents uh, associated with enslaved African Americans, uh, I like to sort of think of as uh, sort of, um, uh, in a way, being a kind of diaspora, much in the same way that their bodies are, are uh, engaged in a diaspora. Their stories after enslavement travel to distant places with them because often they're folks who aren't um, uh, literate or because the documents they create aren't saved or curated in the same way, the stories of enslaved and free black folks um, tend to uh, uh, travel away in the same way that their bodies do. And so this is one of the really sort of really striking and rare examples of a, a, a account that exists in the Rockbridge County Courthouse, and it's only because of um, the uh, law that gets passed um, banning the transatlantic uh, slave trade. So Andrew Alexander, how, how, did, how does he get 25 enslaved people in his lifetime when his father's estate is divided by five or six children and he only inherits two or three? Um, it turns out he marries instead of marrying the Scots-Irish Presbyterian local woman from his local community like his father and grandfather did, Andrew Alexander decides to marry outside the local community. He marries into the Aylett family. Colonel William Aylett is one of the largest slaveholders in King William County. He is an aide-de-camp of Washington at Yorktown and in fact dies of some sort of dysentery or something like it at the Battle of Yorktown. Um, his daughter inherits a portion of his estate, and Andrew Alexander, through the inheritance rules of the time, inherits her slaves from her father. Um, and so this is a story of a young child named Moses who was inherited as part of that estate. Moses' mother and father were inherited by uh, Andrew Alexander's sister-in-law, Rebecca Aylett Lapsley, Lapsley and Moses was inherited by Andrew Alexander's wife and Dandridge Aylett Alexander. Moses is probably two years old when this uh, transaction takes place. The two men, uh, Joseph Lapsley and Andrew Alexander, agree that Moses should be raised by his parents on Rebecca Lapsley's plantation, but they decide to move to uh, Kentucky near Bowling Green her husband becomes Reverend Joseph Lapsley, a very famous and wealthy man. Moses grows to about 12 or 13 years of age, at which point he is forced to leave his parents and everybody he has known his entire life, 
to travel back to Lexington to Virginia to be held as a slave on a plantation with people he's never known before. 12 years old, you know, I remember when our daughter was going off to college at the age of 18 and I thought I was gonna pass out. You know, this is a 12 year old boy held in bondage, brought to Lexington. Um, it's, it's, it's striking the kinds of stories that we're luckily able to find associated with, a, a, um, with the enslaved folks here. Here's a, um, most of the eastern counties were uh, uh, destroyed. Their records were destroyed during the Civil War. King William County is no different. Um, so it just so happens because they were so wealthy, one of the descendants actually had a personal copy of Colonel William A. Litt's will. The county courthouse records were gone, but so we have the, the good uh, grace to be able to find a copy of this estate. And so then there are a number of other things that are taking place during this time as well. So we, of course, have the banning of the transatlantic slave trade, which leads to things like that account of... Uh, um, Moses being sent and brought back to Virginia, but there's also a rising sentiment uh, that becomes the American Colonization Society in 1816 that starts to see that free African Americans and white people should not be living in the same society together. And so this is, uh, uh, of course, an inherently racist ideology, uh, um, but the idea is, is that the folks who are behind this movement are hoping to either get free blacks or purchase the freedom of enslaved blacks so that they can be transported to Liberia to live out the rest of their days in Africa. And of course, most of the free black and enslaved African Americans in this area are second, third, fourth, and fifth Americans and have never set foot in Africa before. So it turns out that many of the folks that were sent to Liberia end up going there and end up dying of diseases they no longer have any kind of resistance to. There's a story about a man by the name of uh, 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 Brown Colbert I could talk to you about if you're interested in, he was one of the Hemings family at Monticello and he's a sad example of this occurrence in which people who are often forcibly, often coerced to go to Africa end up dying in relatively short order when they get there. But there's also a movement through the penitentiary of Virginia in which the legal justice system is, is intentionally sanctioned to take free and enslaved African Americans out of the general population, house them at the penitentiary in Richmond, and send them to Africa. Um, and in fact, um, an example of that happens to be a man by the name of George, who was one of the people held in bondage by Andrew Alexander. George, in 1815, is um, uh, in the late uh, autumn uh, charged with burglary um, in November of uh, 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 1815, he's tried, and on Christmas Day of 1815, he's sentenced to be hung by the neck until dead on the county court square of Lexington for having engaged in burglary. The, um, the uh, uh, um, conditions at the time then, uh, the penitentiary, while not yet established, the practice was already moving in place, and so George was uh, uh, um, given his uh, freedom instead of being hung, but he was sent to Africa. Um, and in fact, the only reason we know this is because Andrew Alexander submitted a request to the governor's council that he be paid for George because he lost the quote unquote value of George through this process. So he in fact uh, petitions and receives $450 for George uh, um, after this process. And this is one of literally hundreds of uh, free and enslaved African Americans who go through this process. Um, a number of other things, of course, personal property tax records showing the rise of uh, uh, the enslaved people in, in the area, including especially Andrew Alexander's through the census records. Um, and so um, 
This is the spot at Liberty Hall where many of these folks are, are held in bondage. There's a subsequent plantation after Andrew Alexander's death owned by the county court clerk, a man by the name of Samuel McDowell Reed. On the eve of the American Civil War, he uh, holds 61 African Americans in bondage on this same landscape, um, but as we'll see, it's a different population of enslaved African Americans. We've done a number of archeological uh, testing, a number of types of archeological testing to supplement Professor McDaniel's work in the 1970s. We did some shovel test pits to get a sense of the boundaries of the site. Uh, we then realized, uh, based on my research uh, at Monticello um, and the stratified random sample we were doing there, that his sample was just too small. So in addition to finishing his sample, we decided to quadruple it in size. Instead of one little meter square per 25 foot block, we've now increased up to four meter squares during that, um, or in that area of the parking lot that we talked about earlier on. And we've been able to identify additional buildings again, not based on direct evidence of stone foundations, like Professor McDaniel was lucky enough to, but to find indirect evidence of the location of domiciles through the artifact patterning and the statistical analysis of this stratified random sample. Uh, and also, in fact, pretty interesting deep uh, colluvial deposits as a result of plowing in the area. So in some areas, relatively intact deposits that we could analyze for much more advanced samples in the future. Um, evidence of a cobble road across this field near the Liberty Hall ruins. Um, and in fact, as it turns out, it looks very much like, um, if you're familiar with Monticello, a place known as Mulber or, uh, yeah, Mulberry Row, in which there's a road with a series of enslaved domiciles that are both um, industrial sites like farrier shops and the domicile of an enslaved person in the evening after they're done with their work. Um, and like Mulberry Row, a series of post holes alongside of that road to suggest that it was shielded from view for some reason. Um, here's in fact one lucky example of uh, one of those later buildings and instead of this uh, log cabin being laid directly on the ground, there was a, a trench dug with um, rubble placed in the trench that would allow the um, logs to rest on stone. It didn't require the skill necessary to do stone masonry, but would at least keep those logs up off of the wet, damp earth and allow them to survive a bit longer. Um, this same building also happened to have a brick chimney that had collapsed along beside it. And uh, once again, returning to David C. Humphreys, uh, trained by Jedediah Hotchkiss, professional engineer and map maker, we have um, uh, georectified the location of that stone rubble foundation and brick chimney to be the exact location of this square building on an 1891 map. Again, you know, deep long-term research allowing us to start identifying these more and more ephemeral historical documents associated with it. And in fact, going back to the overhead photo, the building that we're talking about is that one right there. And if you see on the corner there, it looks like there might be a chimney. I might be stretching, but that's in the same location. Um, we also, in that same spot again, that road that I was talking about sort of goes down through here. Um, we found a number of domestic artifacts, refined earthenwares used for eating and taking tea or coffee in the same location as artifacts associated with some sort of blacksmithing process. We know that Andrew Alexander held two enslaved men in bondage who were blacksmiths, a man by the name of John Anderson and another man named William. Um, and so this was a spot located with a lot of clinker, which is an industrial byproduct of blacksmithing and also of scrap wrought iron that would have been the tail ends and bits of unusable wrought iron that were left in the same location as domestic ceramics and clinker. Um, and here is in fact a really cool spot just adjacent to that with um, pretty clear evidence of uh, plowing. And so we, you know, for years now, for 50 odd, 60 odd years in historical archeology, span have been able to identify areas of plowing based on the kinds of scars that are left behind when the plow digs into the surface. But if you notice also in this photo, 
quite dark sediments in this plow zone that seem to be in the same general area off the north end of the stable in what I'm sort of very sort of um, hopefully calling a farrier shop. I don't know for a fact that that's there because it's all secondary evidence that um, I'm putting together as different lines of evidence. Um, and so this is a uh, artifact map of um, the steward's house, structure nine, with the amount of ceramics in the yard around the house. And I see my uh, great friend and colleague, uh, um, uh, Sarah Bon Harper here, and she's done work, and a number of other people have done work on the yard maintenance around enslaved African Americans' houses and how much of the day to day activity takes place outdoors. Because if you've ever had a cooking fire in Virginia before air conditioning, you do not want to be indoors in July and August. So you raise your children outside, you cook outside, you wash outside, you do a lot of those day to day activities exterior to your domicile, and this is a, um, uh, an interesting pattern here at the site. Likewise, the size of the ceramics in a maintained yard like that tend to be smaller because when you pick up big pieces of broken pot sherds, you leave behind the smaller ones and you selectively move the larger ones. And so we see tantalizing evidence with what is still a relatively small sample that we'll be continuing to excavate over the uh, coming days. And likewise, uh, view shed analysis of the um, uh, farmhouse location where Andrew Alexander would have lived and the enslaved African Americans here, you'll notice there's very little in terms of artifacts on the far side. Having privacy in an enslaved context is often very challenging, and people often would choose places to engage in ritual and other kinds of activity out of the site to the best of their capacity of the enslaver who is overlooking them. Um, and so then, finally coming close to the end here, Andrew Alexander is engaged in a different kind of economic activity than the plantation owners we see in Eastern Virginia. You often see reference to what's called a tobacco monocrop system in Eastern Virginia, at least until the 19th century. And this is largely agriculture. It's largely focused on a labor regime that follows the natural annual cycle of agricultural farming for whatever the main crop may be. Andrew Alexander and folks like him recognize that there are periods in the winter, especially when enslaved people are not being put to hard work as they feel they should be. And so Andrew Alexander, again, alumnus of the Liberty Hall Academy, trained surveyor, trained engineer, decides starting in the uh, 18-teens to engage in a variety of infrastructural projects during the winter by taking the enslaved men he holds in bondage and going out on the road to build a number of roads around Rockbridge County and Amherst County and Bedford County. In fact, Andrew Alexander was up for the principal engineer of the Board of Public Works and he was a finalist and ended up losing out to Claudius Crozet, a fa famous important person, but he decides instead of going directly through the Board of Public Works to be a part of a number of smaller uh, 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 profit uh, organizations that are stock companies associated with public works, like the Le Lexington and Covington Turnpike Company, the uh, Liberty to Balcony Falls Turnpike Company, a number of other uh, 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 construction activities engaged in the area using slave labor, and in particular, like a lot of folks after the uh, um, banning of the transatlantic slave trade, because the value of enslaved people has gone so high, folks like Andrew Alexander are able to hire their enslaved people out to other places in order to earn money on them, even in those interstitial times where they're not working on the road, where they're not working on the, the agricultural plantation. Oh, you've got a week here? I'm gonna hire you out to John Jordan so that he can use you to mine quarry rocks to build the Ben Salem uh, lock. And so he's engaged in a kind of maximization that is, is it's really, it's stunning, I think. Um, and so in fact, a number of folks, and if you look closely here, 
are being hired out to John Jordan, the builder of Washington Hall at Washington and Lee, the center building as it was known at the time. And this is at the exact time that John Jordan and his partner Benjamin Darst are uh, 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 going to um, start and uh, 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 begin the construction, firing bricks, cutting timber, doing all of the groundwork for building Washington and Hall at Washington and Lee. And if you notice also here, 1822 for the hire of Moses, the same young boy who was sent from uh, Kentucky uh, uh, 10 years earlier um, is now being hired out for a year for $85. Here's a photo, one of the earliest photos of Washington Hall, the center building at Liberty Hall, or at, uh, uh, at this point, Washington College. Um, here is the Acts of the General Assembly um, creating the Lexington and Covington Turnpike Company. Um, Andrew Alexander's letter to his son in Georgia. Hey, by the way, I'm going to start building roads with my enslaved people. This is a great new way to make money that people haven't been doing for a while. Um, and so eventually, um, what you know, 1831, the Southampton insurrection takes place, often known popularly as the Nat Turner's Rebellion. Andrew Alexander and a number of Rockbridge County uh, uh, residents start uh, uh, sending letters to their family and people outside of Virginia, reassuring them that they're okay because there's such an uproar over the perceived dangers of the um, uh, 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 Southampton insurrection. He's trying to reassure his son in Georgia that Ayla and I are fine, but he's, there's two white people on the plantation and 25 enslaved African Americans here. You can imagine the kind of existential dread this brings to people in Rockbridge County. And in fact, one of the other letters between his son, Aylett, and William Dandridge Alexander suggests that there are gangs of white folks going around the streets of Rockbridge policing, well-armed, and have gathered up a group of people and taken them to Buena Vista for questioning. Um, uh, um, there's another story that Aylett sends to William about a young man walking on the road to Botetot, Fincastle, the, the county seat of Botetot, and they note that they accost this man because they say he's Nat Turner. They shoot at him, they take his possessions, and he runs off. Um, it turns out Nat Turner never left Southampton County, so uh, a free black man was walking down the street and a bunch of armed white folks shot at him and stole all of his personal possessions. Whether he survived is anybody's guess. Um, but here's a chart that might suggest that maybe he didn't. Um, the census data, if you look at this one, for free black women, follows the same track for free white men, free white women, enslaved men, and enslaved women, but the only population for which that trend does not follow are free black men between the period before Nat Turner's um, rebellion and after roughly 60 free black men in Rockbridge County vanish. So, you know, the more things change, the more they stay the same. Um, eventually, I was able to find in our special collections the conditions by which Andrew Alexander's enslaved people might obtain their freedom, and that was that they should be members of a white church, that they should have behaved themselves well, and they have to be of a, a certain age. Um, and immediately after Andrew Alexander's death, his executors begin to exchange letters in which they try to renege on Andrew Alexander's promise to those enslaved African Americans. And the first executor on the scene is his son-in-law, Samuel McDowell Moore. He writes a letter saying that I believe only Tildy Polly Moses and John Anderson are members of a white church but the last three are the greatest rogues and the most worthless on the plantation. So one of the conditions was that they had to have behaved themselves well, right? So if this white guy says they did not behave themselves well, all bets are off. As it turns out, if you look at the assessment in his estate inventory by his neighbors, in fact, John Anderson and Matilda are the two of the most valuable enslaved people on the plantation. John Anderson is the second most valuable, and Matilda is the most valuable woman. So the executor saying these people are worthless, 
the neighbors are saying, these are the most skilled, most well-trained African-Americans on the plantation. Moses and Polly, interesting story. Almost every document I've been able to come across, Moses and Polly are listed together. Moses and Polly are rented out after Andrew Alexander's death to a woman in Lexington, and they are sold together to that woman at the uh, closure of the estate. Um, and interestingly, while most of this list has folks by gender, men first and then women, Polly, followed by a young woman who was born when Polly was 17, is listed between Polly and Moses. Uh, uh, it's, you know, um, interesting, potentially, again, um, uh, uh, evocative, but we don't know. I haven't been able to track out Moses and Polly, what happens to them after 1847. Um, there's a number of uh, later accounts. One of the granddaughters of Andrew Alexander was born in the household. He notes that the blacksmith on the plantation was teaching a school. Um, my best guess is that that's John Anderson, the troublemaker who is seen as being problematic by the executors. Uh, blacksmiths are well known in most circumstances to be highly intelligent, highly well-educated, and often the people who are at the sort of vanguard of resistance movements in African-American tradition. Um, and, but in fact, she notes, the granddaughter notes, that all of the enslaved folks, with the exception of a few, are marched off by covered wagon to, to Griffin, Georgia. Um, here's a map of that path they had to take from Lexington to Griffin, Georgia. Um, and uh, one last note, Rockbridge County on the 1860 census was almost 24% enslaved African American. There was another maybe 3% free black, so well over 25% of the population of Rockbridge County on the eve of the American Civil War were black. Today, the population of people of color of African descent in Rockbridge County in the Lexington area is 3.42%. So the reign of terror that took place during Jim Crow and the early 20th century pushed most of the formerly enslaved and free black folks out of Rockbridge County with the exception, and so I, I often have folks saying, well, there's just never been anybody of African American descent in Rockbridge County, it's just always been white, right? But that's really, really not the case. 25% in 1860, three and a half percent today. And I'll leave with the names of the people enslaved by Andrew Alexander at Liberty Hall. Thank you. <laughs>